Hello and welcome to another episode of Isn't That Something? I'm Ralph Crew, and I'm forking back. And while that is a reference to a delightful, if not morally and philosophically curious TV show, today's subject is much more down to earth, or at least down to the dinner table. Forks. Something, 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 something. Eating implements vary across history and culture, time and space, and sides of the plate, although I still have no idea how to arrange cutlery properly or even why. Before we dig into the rich devil's food cake, that is the diversity of human food to mouth technology, we have to first finish the metaphorical Brussels sprouts of pre-Anthropocene eatery amongst our animal fork bearers. <clears throat> Non-human animals tend to just use their faces as eating implements. One of the things that really helps with face-based eatery is having a well-developed snout. For instance, most dogs have long snouts that they can jam right into anything that even resembles food and gobble things up without the need for utensils at all. Proboscidean animals like elephants and mammoths I live on in your heart. developed super snouts that act sort of like human arms, ah! tipped with specialized eating utensils that really don't have an analog on our dinner table. The tip of an elephant trunk is like some kind of nose lip finger, a device that is beyond our technical capabilities at the current state of dinner table tech. One can imagine a utopian world in the distant future where forks, knives, spoons, chopsticks, and all of those have been replaced with cybernetic elephant trunks. Go on, imagine it. Isn't that something? Another face-based food manipulator is, of course, the tongue. Wow. Many of the most impressive tongues in the animal world belong to those quirky, fun-loving critters that practice myrmecophagy, that is, eating ants. Myrmecophagus animals often have extremely long, sticky tongues that they use to probe ant nests, an experience that is almost certainly devastating to the ants. Oh no. But great fun for the myrmecophager. Mm. Unsurprisingly, a great example of this tongue adaptation is the giant anteater. Aside from their lingual distinction, they also have legs that resemble giant pandas. Boo pandas! Another notable ant-eating animal is the pangolin. These amazing scaled mammals have tongues that are rooted all the way in their abdomens. They also look like they're really up to something. But since <laughs> most of them are endangered, we really shouldn't try to foil their nefarious plants. Another fascinating lingual morphology can be seen in all of the snakes and some of the lizards. And that is a tongue that is forked. Speaking of forks, of the family of table-based eating implements, forks are the kid's sister to their older U10 siblings, knives and spoons. The earliest evidence of knives appears some two and a half million years ago. Spoons are much younger, which makes sense since you only really need them to eat liquidy things out of bowls or Ziploc bags or whatever. And as far as I know, Homo erectus did very little soup making, preferring more of a paleo diet. Still, the earliest known spoons are well over 21,000 years old. While there is evidence of table forks being used to some degree in ancient Egypt, it wasn't until the Middle Ages that forks gained a permanent place at the Western dinner table. As was the case for a great many things, the arrival of forks in Europe in the Middle Ages inspired controversy and backlash amongst religious zealots. Supposedly, when a Byzantine princess, by the way, the tine at the end of Byzantine is seemingly unrelated to the word tine, used to describe the points or prongs of a fork. Anyway, our Byzantine princess married into European royalty, and when she did, she brought with her golden forks for eating. This was seen as such decadence as to be an insult to God himself. To be clear, people were okay with the gold part. It was the fact that she didn't deign to touch her food with her fingers. A few years later, when she died of plague, this was seen as God's punishment for her forking decadent behavior. Of course, like many such stories, there is further controversy surrounding this, and while it is tempting to follow that historical road, down that particular fork of the metaphorical path lies madness and dense articles that I went cross-eyed reading. Honestly, I can't justify spending all day reading about Byzantine royalty just for five seconds of one of these videos. In 1669, King Louis XIV of France, also known as the Sun King, due to his eminence and thermonuclear core, banned the use of pointed knives at the table, insisting that blunted table knives be used instead. 
While Louis didn't invent table knives, when the Sun King sets a trend, you better forking believe everybody does it. The motivation of the ban on pointed knives, which were often used to skewer bits of food and bring them to the mouth, was to reduce violence. In order to cope with the lack of skewer-capable knivery at the table, multi-pronged or tined forks finally became the norm. In many ways, forks are a symbol of peace, at least in terms of murdering your dinner guests. As the great George Carlin used to say, make fork not kill. Of course, forks are not the only effective way to shovel food into your face. And cultures around the world have come up with other ways to get your eat on. Perhaps the most well-known non-Western eating implements are chopsticks. Some variety of chopsticks have been used in most of East Asia for thousands of years. First seen in China, chopsticks are now commonplace utensils in Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Nepal, Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, and Thailand, just to name a few. It is thought that the famed Chinese philosopher Confucius may have played a role in the introduction of chopsticks as the go-to eating utensil. It is said that he preferred chopsticks because it meant that people didn't have to bring knives to the table, again reducing dinner violence. It really seems that historically, stabbing people at the table was a big problem. Honestly though, after some of the family dinners I've seen, it makes sense. Emily. Many Westerners are probably most familiar with disposable bamboo chopsticks, but various parts of the world use different styles and materials as well. In a bizarre coincidence, the town in Japan most well known for the manufacture of high-end chopsticks is called Obama. Some of the chopsticks from here elevate the form truly into an art. Thanks, Obama! The 20th century brought an era of invention and innovation unlike any period that preceded it. One trend in invention is the combination of two previously separate things into one new and questionably good thing. Things like umbrella hats, or propeller hats, or beer can hats, or the gun hat. Really, I'm just thinking of hats. But like my father used to say, there's more to life than hats. How about a spork? Not only does the spork represent an object which combines attributes of two previously separate things, it is also a great example of a portmanteau. Other fun examples of portmanteaus are the words smog, brunch, Brexit, Spanglish, and man's ear. While sporks are somewhat useful, nobody can really take you seriously while you're holding one. Nevertheless, there are even more advanced versions, combining more utensils like the sporf or the spife, and most excitingly, fork chops. As we explore forks, it's easy to get stuck on the table, but there's a whole wide world of forks out there. Take, for instance, every angry mob's favorite, the pitchfork. This agricultural tool has tines like a table fork, but it is huge and is used to lift and toss or pitch hay or other farm stuff. If the pitch you're talking about is a musical tone, then there's a whole other fork for you. This pitch fork is more often called a tuning fork. These two-pronged metal forks are carefully calibrated so as to reliably produce a very specific pitch, which can then be used to tune musical instruments. As my father always said, you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. While pitchforks and tuning forks, to a much lesser degree, can be used to cause bodily harm, perhaps the most dangerous fork is the fork lift. Despite the name, these machines lift pallets and various things, not just forks. Seriously though, these things are dangerous and you should leave them alone unless you are well forking trained. Forks are often seen in literature and science fiction as well. Take my favorite saying from Stargate, may the forks be with you. Really though, in many time travel features, the forking of timelines and how continuity paradoxes are thusly created and resolved or not resolved are critical elements of the plot and can inspire some really satisfying nerd arguments. Even the flux capacitor itself features a light up fork in the middle. I've heard from nobody at all that the original name was the forks capacitor, but since we are in the bad timeline, we got stuck with flux instead. We see forks all around us. We come to a fork in the road, our blood vessels fork as they distribute oxygen and nutrients around our tissues. Tree branches fork and fork as a tree grows. In fact, somewhat self-similar forking fractals that resemble circulatory systems or tree branches or pulmonary bronchioles are all over the forking world. Even the nature of reality itself 
may be forked. The Many Worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics solves the problem of collapsing wave functions of quantum systems by instead splitting the universe into new copies of itself where each branch of the fork covers one of the superpositional states of the pre-forked quantum state. Once these branches split off, they are totally isolated copies of the universe which go on to have their own separate future history. If this is the true nature of the universe, then untold trillions of worlds are created in this way every second all over the universe. It's a real mind fork when you think about it. If we're going to go down the road of theoretical physics, we should include everybody's favorite, Albert Einstein's general relativity. This is really beyond the scope of this video, but essentially Einstein describes gravity as being the result of massive objects warping the fabric of the universe, combining spatial and temporal fields into a curved, fork-dimensional space-time. Well, that's all the time I have for forks at the moment. Special thanks to the inimitable Pablo Castro for suggesting this topic. Next time you sit down at the dinner table, take a moment to admire your fork and think, isn't that something? Isn't That Something was written, recorded, and edited by me, Ralph Crew. Original music by Kyle Simpson. If you like this video, please consider subscribing, hitting the bell, sharing, liking, etc. If you really like this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Support on Patreon is the best way to keep me going. Click the link in the description for more. Thanks for watching, and explore the world responsibly. Isn't that something?